Welcome to the CAS Health Podcast, the show where we hope to connect our community with healthcare information that's relatable, understandable, and useful to your life, and where you get to know better the neighbors providing your care here. I'm your host, Anne McCurdy, and in today's episode, we'll be talking about winter viruses and upper respiratory infections with rapid care providers, Emily James and Linda Newsom. Before we get started, two quick disclaimers. First, the comments in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of CAS Health. Second, the information in this podcast is not intended to be construed as personal medical advice. Always consult your primary care provider with questions and concerns regarding your health. Welcome. Thank you so much for making time to come talk to us today. Thank you. Thank you. In our first part of the podcast, we like to spend a little time just getting to know you guys. So Emily, let's get started with you. Where are you from, Emily? I am from Corning, Iowa. And Linda, where are you from? I live outside of Corning, Iowa. So both from Corning? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Oh, f- small world. Okay. <laughs> Emily, favorite sports team? Oh, Wyoming Cowboys. Go Pokes. And Linda? Well, I still root for the Miami Dolphins because that was my brother's favorite team. But somebody recently introduced me to the Wyoming Cowboys. So I'm following them now. Oh, well, that's fun. Okay. How about pets at home? I have an eight-year-old black lab named Scout. And I have three cats. Oh, oh, okay. A little bit of a feud there. One dog person, (laughs) one cat person. Okay. (laughs) And if you're cooking dinner to impress, what would you be making? Okay, Emily, what are you cooking? It's gluten-free. Yeah, it's gluten-free. Million-dollar spaghetti um, with spaghetti squash. It sounds delicious. Mm -hmm. So good. Okay, you're going to have to share the recipe. I will. And Linda, how about you? Mine would probably be, I like to make homemade pasta and homemade sauce and experiment with different flavors in the pasta. Ooh, okay. And favorite so far? Probably the black truffle oil that I put in the pasta. Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah, it okay. was really good. Okay. Not gluten-free. Can't Not sample gluten-free. it. Not <laughs> gluten-free. No, no, no. And how about favorite holidays? Mine's Veterans Day. I know. It's unique. Um, So my dad's a vet. He's a Navy vet. And every Veterans Day, we get out his yearbooks and we talk war stories. It's so much fun. That's amazing. We've never had that answer before. Never, ever. So wow, what a great memory for your family. What a great tradition, right? Oh, I love that. Okay, Linda, is a good luck topping that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine would be Thanksgiving because that's the one holiday that my whole family gets together. Uh, we make sure that everybody is there on that day. That's, I love that. We, you are not alone with the Thanksgiving. That is, I'd say by far the number one holiday that we hear. And hobbies. Do you have time for hobbies? <laughs> yeah, we make time for hobbies. Um, anything outdoors. I love to hike, love to fish, love to snowmobile in the wintertime out west. So yeah, like going to the gym, cooking. How about you? Any hobbies? Oh, yes. I love my garden. I have a very large garden. So this time of year, I do a lot of gardening, canning, cooking. I could spend hours in the kitchen. Um, again, being outside, going for walks, um, and photography. Oh, wonderful. Man, really diverse. Okay, I love these answers. Favorite books or movies? My favorite movie right now is The Outpost. It's on Netflix. It's a military movie. Not surprised. <laughs> it's good, though. And how about you, Linda? My favorite movie would probably be, I'm trying to remember the name of it, A Dog's Purpose um, and Marley and Me. Okay, but you have three cats at home. Well, I used to have, <laughs> we used to have dogs. Ah, okay. Um, the place we live now, we don't have a fenced-in area, and we have a lot of wildlife that could harm puppies. So we don't have the, the setup for dogs right now. So. so the dog movies just help fill that void. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I've had dogs sense. all my life <laughs> until now. <laughs> Take, you both have a little bit of a drive, so driving in the car alone, what do you jam out to? It depends. If I'm coming to work, something upbeat, usually like 90s, early 2000s hip-hop. If I'm going home, sometimes just silence. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually like a classic rock, um, or I do a lot of podcasts also. Oh, listen to podcasts. Excellent. The Cast Health Podcast, right? Well, of course. Well, of course. <laughs> of course. Good. And... Okay, last question here for you. Next or dream travel destination? If I'm doing something in the United States, Alaska. If I want to go international, I want to go to Pakistan. To Pakistan? Mm-hmm. I want to see the mountains of Pakistan. 
Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So, and do you think you'll you think you'll get there sometime soon? Probably not anytime soon. Not anytime soon. But hopefully but event- in my lifetime. But eventually. Mm-hmm. Okay. Pakistan. All right. No. Mm-hmm. Uh, well. Same thing in the United States would be Alaska. We've talked about going there for years, my husband and I. And international, I would like to go to Ireland. I have family there that I'd like to go visit. Wonderful places to go visit. So neat. Wow. Great answers. Thank you, guys. We like to hear from providers why they chose the careers that they did. What is it that drew you into medicine? What drew you into the field that you work in now? And maybe just a little bit about like your path to where you are now. So Emily, we'll start with you. Why nursing? Why medicine? And what do you love about rapid care? Oh gosh, why medicine? So as a young child, I did a lot of volunteering at like the local nursing homes, playing bingo, like taking them on like little excursions. It's always super fun. And then I became a CNA, worked as a CNA in high school, did lots of different things with my CNA, and then became a paramedic, decided that I wanted to become a nurse, so then I became a nurse, did lots of things in my nursing career, and then was kind of tired of working overnights, decided go back to grad school one more time, and then, yeah, got my graduate degree from Purdue, and now I'm working as a nurse practitioner. So that's super fun. Why do I like rapid care? It's acute care, it's fast care, it's something different every day, but you still get to see the patients within the community, which I love. Fantastic. So from paramedic to nursing to nurse practitioner, and now you serve patients of all ages in rapid care, like all the time. Yep. What a great path. And Linda, how about you? Well, I started out, I did candy striping and I volunteered at Child Life with Nebraska Medicine and really enjoyed that. I went and got my medical assistant's degree, met a physician assistant there, and she encouraged me to continue on. I started out in surgery for about a year and like my patients to be awake where I can talk to them. So then I started in emergency medicine, did that for 20 years. And, you know, again, you never know what's going to come through the door. With acute care, you can see those immediate results. You can see the patient get better. You can solve their problem and take care of it for them. But you get more of that one-on-one with the patients. I love that. That is wonderful. I, I, I think... Both of you just are so well suited to rapid care. I'm so glad that you're both here. Thanks. Yeah. Rapid care isn't necessarily primary care. There is a difference between primary care providers and rapid care providers. Do either one of you want to speak to what's that difference and what is the role of rapid care versus primary care? So rapid care is basically an acute care clinic. So we're set up to take care of your acute illnesses and injuries, coughs, colds, nausea, twisted ankles, you know, we can do broken bones depending on the severity. Your primary care is going to handle more of your chronic, your diabetes, your hypertension, heart disease, things like that, any medication that needs to be managed, any specialists that need to be seen. Those are all going to go through your primary care. You know, we just kind of do the walk-in, I need to be seen, and I can't get an appointment. Perfect, because we often tell people that, like, Rapid care is a fantastic option, but your first option usually is your primary care provider. So if you can't get in soon enough with your primary care provider, rapid care kind of helps fill that gap, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So when we say those acute illnesses, those things that have just popped up, kiddo woke up today with that sore throat and fever, et cetera, our regular doctor isn't available. So rapid care is like the best place to come then for that gap coverage, so right. to speak, right? Yep. Winter illnesses and viruses. There's a lot, and I feel like there's a lot already going around this year. My goodness, we are coming up to winter, and winter bugs and like flu, COVID, RSV, all that stuff's coming up, right? So, what's circulating right now, and what's up ahead? Common colds, and we have seen one influenza A, so that's coming around. Tons of COVID as we entered into the school year, so I was not surprised, but. Tons of COVID still, and then we're headed right into RSV season. Yeah, and especially with school just starting, it's going to start circulating through the community. But yeah, upper respiratory, the influenzas are going to have both upper respiratory and GI symptoms, depending on the strain. COVID's had some GI symptoms this last strain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's surprising. I didn't know that. 
Mm-hmm. So upper respiratory with GI or maybe just GI symptoms? Uh, just GI. So depending on the strain of the influenza, one strain is more upper respiratory, one strain is more GI symptoms. COVID is kind of all over the board. We really can't predict. We don't know enough about COVID even four years later, but it just kind of comes up and surprises us all the time. Okay. Keeps you on your toes. Mm -hmm. The other one that I think of this time of year is hand, foot, mouth. Yeah. I have seen a couple cases of that already this year. Uh, Mm -hmm. Okay, because I kind of thought that was kind of a September-y sort of a thing, isn't it? Yeah, usually when kiddos go back to school. Mm -hmm. Then they share. Then they share all the things. (laughs) (laughs) And adults are getting it. I saw a lot of hand, foot, mouth last year in adult population. And typically in the past, they just had like runny nose, just didn't feel good, moving on with life. But then they developed the rash last year that I hadn't seen in adults in a long time. Oh, fun. Mm -hmm. Or the mouth sores. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's miserable. Mm -hmm. Miserable. So with all of this circulating and kids in school and we're all getting exposed at work and other places, can we really prevent getting sick? What do you tell people about prevention? Are there vaccines? What do we do? Well, the number one prevention is going to be hand washing Mm -hmm. and just good like oral hygiene, right? If you have a cold or already knows, like make sure you're blowing your nose, washing your hands. Cover your cough. Covering your cough. Yeah. Staying back if you're sick. Are going to be your like number one preventions, mm-hmm. making sure you're getting plenty of rest, fluids, a multivitamin a day. Yeah. So those basic tried and true things. So yeah. if we're not sick, hand washing, mm-hmm. and staying on top of our health, just like we would want patients to anytime. Good sleep, good dietary habits, etc. Right. Right. Yeah. But vaccines out there that you would um, talk about this for this time of year? I think with vaccines, that's definitely something that you want to talk to your primary care provider about. Childhood vaccines are timed at certain times that they get their vaccines. As far as your COVID, RSV, influenza, again, depending on some of your chronic medical conditions, definitely talk to your primary care provider to determine whether you qualify for them and whether they recommend them. Good answer. And seasonal vaccines are available right now, so that's good. (laughs) So when you or a child or a loved one starts developing symptoms of like this, you know, cough and cold type symptoms, right, which could be a whole myriad of things, what's next? Like you you have symptoms, do I immediately come in? What what would you say to patients who are just starting to have symptoms? Well, I think you definitely want to try to give it a few days at home. You know, any kind of persistent fever over 102.5 that is not resolved with Tylenol or ibuprofen that needs to be evaluated. But definitely trying the things at home, the hydration, you know, making sure that you're taking a multivitamin, some over-the-counter cough and cold medications. Again, make sure it's age appropriate. You know, give it a couple days at home to try. Most viruses, symptoms will resolve in about five days, except for the cough. But usually you can just take care of it at home. If you're obviously having shortness of breath, you can't keep anything down. Again, that persistent fever, that's what rapid care is here for, is to to evaluate those illnesses. So those are kind of the tipping points of when you're treating at home and when something might need some additional intervention. So those fevers, Mm -hmm. that nausea, vomiting, can't keep anything down. And what was the third one that you mentioned? Any shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, anything like that. Okay. You said cough and cold medicine as appropriate. So are there some populations that maybe those medications aren't recommended? So most of your over-the-counter cough and cold medications and your Tylenol and ibuprofen, they will have an infant, a child, and an adult dosing. And they come, the infant is liquid, the child is either liquid or chewables, and then the adult is pills. And depending on the child's weight and age depends on what types of medications you can give them. Some of the -the over-the-counter medications contain a certain type of medicine that we don't recommend for infants and so on. So it, it's definitely age appropriate as to what you can use. And most of the boxes that the medication comes in will list, you know, under the age of 12, ask your primary care, you know, ask a provider. Under this age, you know, check with your provider. So you always want to make sure that you're reading those instructions and doing your appropriate dosing. Perfect. And the Tylenol and ibuprofen, like I, I would say sometimes you hear people say, well, I'm not going to give it because I want the fever to do its job. Do you hear that? 
All the time. Mm -hmm. All the time? <laughs> okay. And what do you say to patients when you hear that? Please give your child or yourself Tylenol ibuprofen. I will absolutely believe you if you've told me you've had fevers and you've been unwell, but we want to see what the Tylenol ibuprofen is doing for you when you come, right? Like if you're having those persistent fevers greater than 102.5 and you've taken the Tylenol and ibuprofen consistently, you might have a bigger problem that we need to address and dive in deeper into versus, well, I wanted you to know that I had a fever. I wanted to prove to you, yeah, right? We, we believe you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and just generally, we see a lot of times they'll bring their child in and they look sick and they look like they don't feel well. And they're, you know, just sitting in mom's arms and we give them Tylenol or ibuprofen in the clinic. And 30 minutes later, they're running around the room and they're more active. It just, it does, it, it makes you feel better. And even if they don't have a fever, they might be running some intermittent low grade fevers, but they're just a little punky. Mm -hmm. Give them the Tylenol and Motrin and your kiddo will do they'll be back to their baseline they will want to run around and eat and drink and mm -hmm. play and do the things that you're worried about when you're bringing them in so don't wait on it if, if you're starting to see those symptoms it's do it go ahead and do the tylenol and the ibuprofen etc right mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. so yeah. okay and it, read the boxes to make sure we're giving the right medication at the right dose for the right age right yep. yeah and they can always reach out to the pharmacist too like where they're buying these over-the-counter medications the pharmacist can help guide them and this one's maybe not age appropriate this one is you know they can help with that good good idea good advice okay so we've decided you know this cough and cold that's been around for a couple of days there's something about it that's worrying me so we decided to come into rapid care at that point does it matter if we test for flu and covid and rsv does it always matter that we know the exact cause is that a tricky question no <laughs> um so basically any virus, which COVID, RSV, and influenza are, are all viruses, antibiotics will not treat those. That's all over-the-counter, supportive care, things that you need to do at home. For some people in certain circumstances, and it's usually job-related, they need to know whether it's COVID, whether it's influenza, whether it's RSV. And those are the people that work with a certain population of other people. That's really the only time I can think that it's required that you know what you have. Now, that being said, there are other types of infections, bacterial infections, which will need antibiotics, you know, and different medications that we can do. So for viruses, it's the same treatment. For bacterial infections, then that's when we need to look at what medications we can use. And for me, viral testing, if I have high suspicion that you have a viral illness, having a name for it for me, it doesn't matter. Mm -mm. Your treatment's not going to change. And we only are able to test for COVID, influenza, and RSV here at CAS. So you might test negative on our triple swab, but you might still have a viral illness. And for some patients, I think that's frustrating because I'm telling you, you have something viral, but I don't have a name for it. There's hundreds of thousands of viruses and the testing is super expensive and we're sending out those tests if we are doing them. And then it doesn't really change your treatment management, right? Like you're still going to do your rest, your fluids, Tylenol and ibuprofen, over-the-counter cough, cold medicine, and then you're going to wait your duration and you're, you're going to get better usually. So everything with a virus, we're really just treating the symptoms and we're letting it run its course. Mm -hmm. right. Like there, there's no magic bullet to <laughs> make that go away. So it's, it's just really managing symptoms, dealing with it, and living through it for, you know, five, seven days, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, usually. And the viral cough will linger for a couple weeks. A lot of people say, well, I was sick two weeks ago. I feel so much better, but I can't get rid of this cough. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a viral cough, and, and those do linger. They can linger, you know, four or five weeks after you're feeling better. And is there a tipping point with those viral coughs? Is there a point where those need to be evaluated? You've been coughing for two weeks, you know, gosh, is it still weighted out? Or is there something that you as a provider say, hmm, that maybe needs checked out? If your cough changes, for me, I mean, you've had this dry sort of persistent cough now. You have this thick, productive cough. You've returned to fevers. You're truly not feeling well you feel like you've you were getting better and now you had this cough for a long time and now my symptoms are returning and I don't feel good well did you get hit with another viral illness or is it turning into a bacterial pneumonia we need to like further address that good advice so for those coughs that last a couple of weeks afterwards will I need to follow up with rapid care on a cough or do I need to follow up on a cough with my primary care provider? We always suggest following up with your primary care provider because Linda might have seen you in the clinic or the rapid care clinic and then 
she's gone for a few days and then you see me as a follow-up well I didn't see you the first time truth can be said about primary care but they are at least familiar with you typically and it's always a good idea if you've been seen by an acute care provider to follow up and make sure things are improving with your primary care for me I always tell my patients you saw me today but I need you to call your primary care and get in I know it's going to be a few days before you can get in to see them but you want to be on their schedule so yeah, I do recommend if they're planning a follow-up to call that when you leave rapid care, call and make an appointment. I know it's going to be two weeks, but if you're suddenly feeling better and you don't need that appointment, it's easier to cancel. Then all of a sudden you feel worse and now you can't get into your primary care and you end up back in rapid care, which we're happy to see you. But again, like Emily said, we don't have the same providers there daily, so we're not familiar with you. So primary care providers, they know your baseline and they've seen you before and maybe have seen you with other types of illnesses like this. So they kind of have a better sense, you're saying, of where you should be at and what treatments you may need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So kiddo has been sick for a while. This cough has been going on. And as a parent, I am seeing some things change that have caught my attention. Maybe some like their breathing seems odd or fast, or they just seem different in how they are coughing or breathing. Is that a warning sign? Is that a reason why I need to come in? Yeah, that's an acute change from their previous symptoms. So for us, we like to monitor for retractions. So retractions, we strip your kid's clothes off. We look at the chest If we can see in between their rib space, those are retractions that can happen between the rib space on either side, front and back, and into their clavicles or their collarbones. Sometimes they suck in even along their throat. We can see that sometimes. And we want to see those kiddos for sure. Nasal flaring is another one where their nostrils seem to enlarge. They're trying to suck in air. Yeah, those definitely need to be seen. And kiddos that are sort of tripoding, right? They're bending forward trying to catch their breath. Those patients need to be seen. Yeah. Actually, if you have any concern about your child's breathing, you should have them evaluated. Good, solid advice. Like, good baseline. Yep. Breathing? <laughs> Come see us, right? Yep. Okay. How about croup? Croup is that cough that, you know, those, those big, barky coughs, right? Do we see that here during this time of year? Yeah, we do see it this time of year. And it's one of those that during the day, they're fine. They seem fine, maybe not quite themselves, but they're eating, they're drinking, they're playing. And at night... Mom brings them into the emergency room at 2 o'clock in the morning because they sound like they're dying. They sound like they can't breathe. By the time they get into the hospital, they're fine. And moms are always like, really? She was breathing really, really funny, and she couldn't breathe. And we believe you. It's a very distinct cough. They call it a barky or a seal. The cold air actually stops the spasm. So the act of taking him outside, putting him in the car, and driving him in is what stopped the spasm. So things you can do at home, obviously, if you're concerned about their breathing, bring them in. But you can definitely take them out, walk around in the driveway if it's a cool night, you know, and see if that'll kind of calm and stop that spasm. Or open the freezer door. Hold them and open the freezer door. Yes, I say do not put the child in the freezer. Do not close the (laughs) freezer door. (laughs) But that cold air from but the, the cold air the from the open door. <laughs> yes, got it. Key piece of information there. So, yeah, yeah. Please do not put your child in the freezer. <laughs> and and is, is is croup really a a diagnosis or is it just kind of a catch all term? It's a diagnosis. It's a yeah. diagnosis. Yeah, it's a, a viral illness and mm-hmm. it's based off their symptoms. So RSV, we often think about kiddos, but it could also be adults. So are we getting into RSV season, and is there anything different we should know about RSV? We are getting into RSV season. RSV can affect any patient, any age. We typically see it in our littles, in our elderly population. But last year, we saw several young adults to middle-aged adults that had RSV, and they were really sick. Yeah. If it is, are you going to test for RSV? We can test for RSV, but we don't have to because it's viral and we're going to treat it the same. Yeah, I think most of the testing for RSV is going to be on the very littles and the older population. The older population is going to have more chronic medical conditions that we might need to be concerned about. And the little ones, their airways are smaller than adults. So when they become inflamed, it is more difficult for them to breathe. So I think those are the two extreme populations that we worry about as far as, is this something we need to monitor very closely? And I think last year, we incidentally found that our older school age, middle-aged adults had RSV because it was part of our triple swab. 
it wasn't because we were just testing them because we thought they had RSV. It was just we tested them for influenza and COVID. And as part of that, they, oh, guess what? You actually have RSV. That makes sense. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Sore throats. Man, I think about my kiddos, you know, they get those sore throats and you just instantly worry, is this the start of a cough and cold sort of situation or is this strep? How do we know? What do we do? So a lot of things can cause sore throats. The strain of influenza earlier this year, we were actually seeing the symptom was a sore throat. And you know, over the years, I'm like, I always used to know strep, and now all of a sudden, some viruses are causing sore throats. So definitely pain with swallowing, you know, coughs can cause a sore throat. You definitely want to bring them in to be evaluated if their tonsils are enlarged, they have difficulty swallowing. Again, usually bacterial infection is going to have the fever. Viruses can also have that. So it's just kind of one of those Again, you want to give it a few days over-the-counter treatment to see if it gets better, but definitely a bacterial infection causing a sore throat, then we do need to get them on some medication. For me this year, and even last season, strep didn't look like strep. Mm -hmm. When we look and do our exam, it doesn't look like strep. And so you're always surprised. So I always tell parents, there are some patients that have like tonsillitis that's like, oh yes, this is absolutely what this is. But if they don't have their tonsils and there is a small chance that they could still get a strep throat, we need to swab them so we don't miss that. But mm -hmm. Does it look like strep? No, but I've also been surprised in the last two years. So, Yeah, it's it's continually changing, and what we used to know, what we used to see is is different now. So, you know, that's what we're here for. Bring them in, let us swab them, and if they need to be on medication, we'll get them on medication. And most of the testing that you do in rapid care is pretty rapid also, <laughs> yeah. right? Like whether, whether you are testing for influenza or strep, like usually you have results pretty quickly, correct? Yeah, our strep swab takes about a half hour, depending on the machine and how many we have on the machine. And then our viral swabs take about an hour, again, depending on the machine and how many are on there. But yeah. So often are patients waiting or patients are home and then you call them? Patients are home typically, yeah, because that's where they're comfortable. And then we call them. Yeah, if you're not feeling well, the last thing you want to do is sit in a waiting room with a bunch of other sick people. Personally, I want to go home, rest, get my fluids, just kind of take it easy. And you can call me in half an hour or an hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things I love about my chart, too, is that the results pop up right away, too. And so you have that notification. Mm -hmm. um, so you have that little heads up. So that way, when you do get that phone call, you can be ready with the questions of like, okay, well, what's next with this positive result that I see? So. Do you guys start to see more ear infections this time of year, or do ear infections just non-seasonal year-round? I mean, they kind of come in seasons, but a lot of parents will come and want their kids' ears to be checked because they are sick with other things, right? Or they are tugging, and they're pulling, and they're just not feeling good. So we always welcome those parents to bring their kiddos in so we can see because that isn't something they can see usually at home. And yeah, we take a peek at them. And sometimes those ear infections, they could be secondary to something else going on, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, especially the little ones parents will say they're tugging at their ears. So they're concerned about an ear infection. But when we evaluate the child, they actually have a lot of nasal congestion. And for a little one, that nasal congestion has that full sensation in their ears. So that might be why they're tugging at them is more they're congested as opposed to an infection. So it's good to be able to differentiate between what's causing them to tug because they can't say it hurts. And sometimes like littles, they're teething and they're tugging mm -hmm. on their ears. So sometimes it's a comfort thing for them, but yeah. parents don't know and that's okay. That's why we have you guys. Yeah. Yeah. So you can look and tell us. <laughs> <laughs> stomach bugs. You know, that's what I think about too often with kids being back in school. They love to share those stomach bugs right away. So that like vomiting and diarrhea, those sorts of things. Again, when do I need to evaluate? When should I bring a kiddo in? What do we do? So if you can't keep anything down, and when I say that, you want to start off slow. So sips of your Pedialyte. I always recommend, when I worked at Children's Hospital, we recommended the blue and the yellow or the clear. The fruity ones can be too sweet when their stomach is upset. So you kind of want to go with, if you can call it a bland Pedialyte or Gatorade, low sugar, that kind of thing, just to calm the stomach. We often refer to the BRAT diet, which is B-R-A-T, bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. Again, you just want to think of very bland things and also things that the stomach doesn't have to work to digest. 
if you're nauseated, you know, pizza and tacos aren't a good idea. Stick with your broth and your soups, things that, you know, your applesauce, mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, you know, just kind of things that you don't have to work to digest. Nothing spicy, salty, citrusy, fried, that kind of thing. And really, if your kiddo doesn't want to eat, that's okay. Like, if they're not eating, then making sure that they're doing an electrolyte replacement and getting those fluids in and resting the Tylenol Motrin and give them a couple days, right? As long as they're having urine output and they're having no fevers, then usually they're going to turn around. It's when they absolutely refuse to eat anything. They're still having major output with vomiting and diarrhea. They maybe aren't having wet diapers necessarily, and they're just acting not like themselves, then we want to see them. But those viruses, I mean, they take a couple days. And we don't want to eat when we don't feel good, right? So neither do littles. So as long as they're still getting some sort of fluids in and we're managing that side of things, don't sweat it if they don't want to eat. Right. Okay. Kids will eat when they're hungry. Okay. So if it's been a couple of days, kiddo is still lethargic, not themselves, still not eating very much. We still just have some concerns. Um, Rapid care, primary care, what do I do? I think either primary care or rapid care. Obviously, primary care, you might not get in right away. So that's where rapid care is handy, right? And then for me, like your kiddo has high fevers. They haven't eaten and drank anything in a couple days. They're having those low outputs. You truly are concerned about your kiddo, right? Because you know your kiddo better than we do. We want to see them. Yeah, definitely. If they're, you know, lethargic, like Emily said, you know, high fevers, not eating or drinking. The urine output is definitely kind of one that we look at. You know, they appear dehydrated. They kind of get those little sunken eyes. Their tongue is dry. Those kind of things, we definitely need to see them. So adults, I know like when I get sick, that sinus pain, do you see a lot of that in rapid care? Yeah, every day. (laughs) Every day? Every day. Not even just like this time of year, like every day year round? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay, so what do we do? You know, again, you want to try treating it with your antihistamines. Decongestants will dry up the sinus cavities. I always tell people use a decongestant. begins with a D. It's going to dry. It's a way to remember. An expectorant expels things, so that makes you cough. So a decongestant's going to dry you up. But again, if you're having the fevers, you know, the sinus pain, pressure, come on in, let us take a look. We want to take a look at the sinus cavity see if they're really swollen and inflamed. I mean, there's a lot of things that the -the over-the-counter sinus rinses and things like that can help. But if it's an infection, then yes, you need to be on some medication. And sometimes for us, the duration of your symptoms, you know, paint a good picture for us. You woke up today and you have the sinus pain and pressure. Is it likely a bacterial sinusitis? No, it's likely something viral or even your allergies have flared up. And we may ask that you try some over-the-counter things and go home and then come back to us if you aren't feeling better or things are worsening. Yeah, if you've had the sinus pain and pressure congestion for, you know, five to seven days, then you need to be evaluated. And at that point, if it is a sinus infection, then antibiotics are probably the next course. Mm -hmm. So when we have these illnesses, these upper respiratory infection type of winter viruses and things like that, we've talked about some of the -the over-the-counter treatments. What are the other supportive cares that you talk to patients about, whether it's for kids or for adults? What are those other things that you might recommend? I definitely think antihistamines, Benadryl, Zyrtec, Claritin, Allegra, those types of things. A lot of people like the saline rinses or neti pots, your Gatorades, Powerades, your electrolyte type drinks herbal teas, old-fashioned Vicks. I love Vicks when I'm sick. Steam showers, heating pad if you need it for body aches. If you have fevers, cool compresses. Cool mist humidifier. Yeah, humidifier, especially for littles because they're not able to, you know, fully blow their nose and no child likes having saline put up their nose. So if you have that humidifier going at their bedside, then that's thinning out their secretions for them. Yeah, and little, little ones, nasal suction. Yeah, nasal suction, which they don't love, but (laughs) that's their way of clearing it, right? So they have to have it. Well, I always tell people when you're doing the nasal suction, they get upset and they cry. And if you think about it as an adult, what happens when you cry? Your nose nose runs. runs. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So that actually has a dual benefit by getting the secretions out and actually causing them to try to you know, get their nose to run. Brilliant. <laughs> it sounds so mean, but it's, it's really not. It, <laughs> so it is helping them feel a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
like the nose Frida, I think those are probably a lot easier for parents to use rather mm-hmm. than like the bulb syringe. I mean, I was four kids in when I was like, Dr. Whipler, show me again how to use this because I felt like I wasn't very effective with the bulb syringe. So if you feel like that, you know, maybe try something like the nose Frida because I, I don't know, if, is there another good way to help littles? No. 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 <laughs> it's just hard, isn't it? <laughs> it is. <laughs> what should we keep stocked at home? Tylenol Motrin, number one. Yep. <laughs> I like Delsum, especially at bedtime, cough suppressant. Usinex, if you feel like you have stuff in your chest that you need to break up, that's designed to help make you cough so you can break up the junk in your chest. A lot of patients don't realize that. Cough drops, sore throat lozenges. And even if you don't love sore throat lozenges, you can do things like hard sugar-free candies just to help soothe your throat. Keeping Gatorade, Powerade, Pedialyte for those littles at home is really important. The antihistamines, you might not feel like you have allergies, but the antihistamine will help with the nasal drainage and help kind of keep you dry. Saline. Mm -hmm. Can you couple the antihistamines with these other over-the-counter meds or do you need to double check the ingredients on that? I would double check. Some of them are combo meds. Some of the cough cold medications are combo medications. You don't want to be taking like a double antihistamine, but yeah. Yeah, definitely. Again, check with your pharmacist, read the labels because yeah, a lot of the cough cold medicines, like Emily said, are combinations. So they will have an antihistamine in them. They will also have usually Tylenol or acetaminophen in them. So you always want to make sure that you're not double dosing when you're taking something over the counter. Perfect. So sharing, boy, those kids at school, they love to share. (laughs) As a parent, what advice do you give for the, is my kid still contagious and can they go back to school? And I know that's going to change a little bit based on what the diagnosis is, but do you have some advice for parents on, or adults too, when is it okay for me to be back around other people? Are you fever free for 24 hours without the use of Tylenol and ibuprofen? Are your symptoms starting to show signs of improvement, right? You don't want to go back if you are worsening, even if you don't have fevers, like then you're still considered contagious at that point. You're still shedding that viral illness. Yeah. You know, any bacterial infection or viral infection is contagious. Well, I shouldn't say any, most. You know, so again, you go back to your hand hygiene, covering your cough, you know, taking care of the symptoms over the counter. But yeah, kids share everything. So your rapid care providers, you spend your day around sick people, <laughs> right? How do you guys stay healthy? Hand washing, mask wearing. hmm taking our multivitamin, drinking plenty of fluids. Yep, doing all of the recommendations. But yeah, hand sanitizer before we go in the room, when we come out of the room, gloves, masks, washing hands. Yeah, doing all of that that we recommend that you do at home. Giving our patients space when they're having a coughing spell so we can keep that distance. Mm -hmm. And then returning back to our exam. Yeah, our hands are raw by the end of the flu and cold season. Just all the hand washing. (laughs) Every patient. Yeah, hand washing seems so basic and it sounds like it's, but it's probably the most effective thing that Mm -hmm. we need to be doing. Yes, it is. And really just protecting your face. It seems silly that we're still wearing masks and we don't have a mask mandate, but truly we're doing that to protect ourselves and to protect our next patient that we're going in to see, right? Because the next patient might be immunocompromised and we were just in with a really sick kiddo. We don't want to give that to them. So we're changing out our masks, washing our hands, putting on new mask, going in. Again, trying to stop that sharing that's going in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for taking this time to come and talk to us. I've learned a lot. I think this is great information for everyone. So thank you. Thanks for having us. Yes, thank you very much.